let's start with the problem. Who has the problem? What is it? What have they already tried? You know, what's already out there for them? And how is this going to be different or get through to them in a different way? Even if it's the same advice, how is it going to get through to them? There are plenty of books on habits, right? But people have read them. And if you look at the Amazon reviews for the different habits books, and especially the popular ones, they'll always say, I've read seven books on habits. I've read 15 books on productivity. This is the one, right? But if you, again, if you dissected those books into their bullet points, you'd probably find 90% overlap. But because of the way the author transmits it, the examples they use, all these little details that make you, you, you know, your authentic voice, whatever we want to call that thing, that's what got through. And that's what I try to help authors do is figure out, like, what's the way that you can talk about this that no one else can talk about it that might reach a reader no one else can reach. What does it take to put your life's work out there in a really big way? How much can I do with this one precious life? Welcome to The Selfish Gift. A lot of us think that we have a book in us, and maybe most of us do, but is it a book that people are really going to want to buy and be interested in reading? My guest here today is going to help us figure that out. David Muldauer is a native New Yorker who spent more than a decade as an editor in New York Publishing, where he worked with authors ranging from Deepak Chopra to David Mamet before going freelance as a book collaborator. David specializes in helping experts in business and personal transformation develop books and also book proposals. Hey, David, thank you for joining me. Hi, Maggie. So nice to see you. So today I want to talk to you about differentiation. Can you tell me what does this word mean in the context of book publishing and why does it matter? Sure. Well, the thing about advice is, you know, the books I work on, whether they get called business books, self-help books, uh, they're all prescriptive. They all offer advice, almost, almost without exception. And, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. We have a big resurgence uh, with a few major authors lately in uh, stoicism. That's a big topic. This is, thousands, this is advice that is thousands of years old, and it's routinely making it to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. So the question that an editor is thinking about is, you know, what is the spin? What is the spin on this advice? Um, this is not, it's not about there's a new way to do X, although sometimes there is, but generally speaking, it's really about um, how the material is differentiated. And there's a number of ways that that happens, both in terms of who is delivering the advice, how they're delivering it, who their intended uh, reader is. And you shuffle those things around and you can come up with a very, very different product that if you somehow boiled the book down to its bullets and people do this, you'll see those kinds of on Amazon, like all the advice from this book for a dollar. <laughs> I don't know whether it's legal, but people do that. It would be the same bullets for 10 completely different books that you would never even necessarily connect as similar. But if you boiled it down to their bulleted tips, just in the plainest possible language, it would probably be 80% the same advice. So the differentiation is that's the unique element that makes the difference between a reprint of Stoicism from 2000 years ago and a Ryan Holiday book that sells however many copies on the bestseller list. So it's the thing that sets a book apart from others in the category or it gives it a unique personality, some kind of thing that makes the reader go, what? Oh, cool. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, who you are changes, right? You're, I'm a college student. I'm a parent of three kids. I'm a busy manager. And so, you know, I worked at a, you know, after I left book publishing, I was running a business and, and, and life education channel for a online education startup. And we would do courses like Instagram marketing. And you would make a course like that. And some people would sign up for it and some wouldn't. You'd say, well, why didn't you sign up for that? Oh, well, I'm a photographer. I, I, I need Instagram marketing for photographers. Mm -hmm. And we were like, it's the same advice. What do you, what do you, it doesn't matter who, it, like who you are. It's how to market on Instagram. But that didn't, that didn't get through. So as soon as you label it Instagram marketing for photographers, suddenly people are signing up for the course. You don't have to change any of it. Now that doesn't work for books <laughs> necessarily, but that idea that the book has to be for me, whoever mm -hmm. I think of myself as, offering maybe almost the exact same advice um, that's really important, you know, because you can kind of feel from the title, from the subtitle, from the cover and the design, from the choice of words, 
which is a huge part of it. Just having that in mind who you're talking to, the examples that you choose to illustrate. Um, you know, I do. Uh, if you do a book on innovation, if you're talking about entrepreneurship, that's going to appeal to one reader. And if you talk about being a middle manager, that's going to appeal to another reader. And it's it can be hard sometimes. You can try to appeal to everyone. You can actually lose both sides because yeah, it doesn't was, sound authentic to either audience. I going to ask you about that. And, th- and that's yeah. an issue, right? Because I know that a lot of authors that we work with um, or anyone who's kind of new to writing a book, um, uh, they, they often struggle with this question of, like, well, I don't want to, you know, this, a lot of people could benefit from this and I don't want to leave any of the market out. I want to, you know, kind of like be really broad and write for everyone. Um, but that actually can be counterproductive because then it, it's a bland book and it sits on the shelf and it just doesn't strike the reader between the eyes and say, this is That's for right. you. Yeah. And then, yeah, the solution, the solution is not to go broad. The solution is not to just say everything as generally as possible. A human being enters a facility if you speak in that way, you, you appeal to no one. On the other hand, if you are very, very, very specific, you are much more likely to win over one audience. And when one audience is won over, they can then market your book to other audiences. They can say, you know, once you find out, for example, that, you know, every C-suite leader in America has read this book, right? You can almost hear the Instagram ad. <laughs> You know, it's a lot of book ads on Instagram. Like every CEO in America, the top Fortune 500, you know, 49 out of 50 Fortune 50 companies read this book and says it's their Bible for management. As soon as you hear that, you're not a C-suite leader. You're not the head of a Fortune 50 company. But the idea that it works for that person, and that's why we there's a, there was an explosion, especially uh, you know, 10 years ago, of, of like Navy SEAL, anything with the Navy SEALs, but because they, we associate them with the you know Osama bin Laden's, you know, and all that stuff. It's like Oh, an exercise routine that works for Navy SEALs. I'm not a Navy SEAL, right? But if it's their exercise, that's got to be the best one. So you have right. to understand, like, you win over one group, and that can be the, the domino. But if you don't win over anybody, because your advice is for everybody, then you're completely undifferentiated. And I, I promise you, whatever your advice is, I can find you a book that was published five years ago that's saying the same things, but has a personality. Why would the editor acquire your book? So why do you think it's so hard for new authors to identify what that special differentiating factor might be in their material? So the the example I use is this. If you're a doctor, you don't read some, like you, the owner's manual. Remember you, the owner's manual. That was a huge um, best-selling book of sort of, here's some nice tips about health. A doctor, unless they're looking to debunk it, is not going to read pop medicine books. They have no idea. In fact, often they're the least informed. If you talk to a doctor about any sort of recent ideas about diet or anything outside of sort of academic medical publishing, because they're the experts and they're kind of in that world of of academic learning and of professional learning. And that pretty much applies across the board. If someone is an expert, a practicing expert to the point where they feel qualified to write a book, generally speaking, they are completely ignorant of the shelf. They have no idea what the big books are, they have no idea of the trends, and uh, they are, and they might remember something from when they were younger, but as far as what's out now, they have no idea. So people will come in and they'll say, I love this. It's, it's called, you just cut the carbs and you lose weight. And it's like, cut the carbs? Are you talking about Atkins? What, a South Beach diet? Like, they have no, I, I'm on, I, I literally had a guy call me once who was a molecular biologist and wanted to explain the chemical mechanisms that you lose weight by cutting carbs. And I was like, but I don't get it. Like, does that help? Like, does that help me choose what foods? To... No. But now you now this is the science <laughs> underneath oh, the diet. Gosh, and I was like, right, well, who's the audience for this? He he thought somehow that someone would read South Beach Diet or something and not do it. But once they saw the organic chemistry diagrams, then they <laughs> would do it or something. I, he, he hadn't even thought it out because <laughs> ultimately, when people get stuck here, it's because they're not thinking like a reader. Oh, they don't read my, these books. Yeah. They're not thinking like the audience. They don't read. Ultimately, they don't know who the audience is. And they, no offense to some of the listeners, they don't really care. They really don't care. They're not there to solve anyone's problem. It's just they have an expertise. They want to be recognized for the expertise. And how they get from, from where they are to being recognized for their expertise is a big gray area that they don't really understand. And so when I talk to someone like this, if I can, it's not always possible. I try to explain, like, let's start with the problem. Who has the problem? What is it? What have they already tried? 
you know, what's already out there for them and how is this going to be different or get through to them in a different way? Even if it's the same advice, how is it going to get through to them? There are plenty of books on habits, right? But people have read them. And if you look at the Amazon reviews for the different habits books, and especially the popular ones, they'll always say, I've read seven books on habits. I've read 15 books on productivity. This is the one, right? But if you, again, if you dissected those books into their bullet points, you'd probably find 90% overlap. But because of the way the author transmits it, the examples they use, all these little details that make you, you, you know, your authentic voice, whatever we want to call that thing, that's what got through. And that's what I try to help authors do is figure out like, what's the way that you can talk about this and no one else can talk about it that might reach a reader no one else can reach. I love that you said, think like a reader. It's my very favorite phrase in the world. And I use it every single day. Um, and, uh, it's so critical and it is, I think it is the one blind spot that, that most people have when they approach their book, what they're, what they're, what they're doing is they're looking inside of themselves and thinking, um, what, what is fresh and unique about me? Um, and sometimes just like your, you know, your molecular biologist, they overestimate what, they believe is special, unique, compelling, different, and really underestimate what um, what a reader really values in what they have to share. So step number one is get yourself into a bookstore and look at the shelf and try to put on that beginner's mindset, that, that sort of, that reader's lens, um, would you say? I Under don't go into a bookstore. Ooh. It can be very deceptive. <laughs> it can be very deceptive. Um, I love bookstores. But they provide a very, very curated glimpse. And it can be very deceptive because they're going to show books that they know sell better that might be 10 years old. They, they're not worried about kind of the, the publishing mindset. They're just going to sell you the book they think is the best book, especially in an independent bookstore. You really have to look at what's recent. You really have to look at what's selling, not just at your bookstore, but generally, like lots and lots of Amazon reviews. I use Amazon. I use other online bookstores. I look at what people who have read this book have also read these other books. Mm -hmm. I try to kind of build a map. That's and so I'm interesting, David, topic. because I, I always, I always say, don't necessarily just wade into Amazon. I, I encourage people to go into a bookstore be, is precisely because it's curated. I can see how like an independent neighborhood bookstore would be perhaps, um, you know, a little too arbitrarily skewed to the taste of whoever, you know, is this, the, the, the buyer, the store manager or doing the merchandising there. But if you go into, a, <clears throat> but if you go into a big metropolitan Barnes and Noble, you're going to find like a pretty, you know, I think the curation is, is helpful because it cuts out, like when I go onto an Amazon, just sort of like searching for a topic, um, I just find it overwhelming. You get a lot of, um, you get a lot of like, minor books cluttering up your mind space. And, and it can be hard, I think, for someone who's wading into that space to sort of sift through all that. But tell me more about some of those other techniques you were just describing. So, so curated you know, lists, a, a, a huge part of the discussion that this is popularity. And I've gotten burned going into Barnes and Noble before and seeing a book and saying, that's exactly the kind of book, you know, that's, and then you go back and you see that it has seven reviews on Amazon and, you know, it sold three copies. Because again, like there's all kinds of random books in your bookstore that no one has ever heard of. And even at the large Barnes and Nobles in the metropolitan area, the local store owner, like the person who's merchandising for that store can put in all kinds of stuff. And if they're trying to fill a table on around a certain topic, so you can see stuff in there. And without the time, of course, you can just pull out your phone and check Amazon. But ultimately, you really do have to vet what you're seeing in the bookstore against Amazon and other online bookstores to check for number of reviews. Obviously, if you have access to BookScan numbers, which publishing professionals sometimes do. That's even better. But even that can be deceptive because there are many books that have sold millions of copies that have almost nothing on BookScan because they sold through outlets, other kinds of outlets. Um, so I've been tricked in all kinds of ways. That's why I'm very specific about these things. But ultimately, you don't have to understand the whole publishing industry the way that I'm expected to or you're expected mm -hmm. to. As an author, you need to learn your category. You mm -hmm. need to know who the people are. You're not going to be surprised because ultimately, if you're looking at, at comps, older ones are useless. You can't use them in a book proposal if they're more than a few years old. And we can talk about that if you want to. But the important thing is, if that author is not out there now as a thought leader, just don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. If they're retired, if they if they passed away, like they're not part of the discussion anymore as far as you figuring out where you fit. You need to know who the people are in your space. And in all likelihood, they have books or they're working on books. or They have a lot of books. 
you got to know who they are. So if you're really just you doing your thing in your one specific area, you don't even need my technique of like going on Amazon and figuring. You need to know your category mm-hmm. and you need to know what everyone is up to. If you are a uh, fitness expert who trains people in like different kinds of workouts and you have a particular spin, you're like a CrossFit guy. You have to know who Kelly Sturette is. You have to know who that is. You know what I mean? And you have to be subscribed to his newsletter and you have to see when he publishes a book and when it's coming out, who his publisher is and what agent he works with. You need to get this information. And it's not an onerous task to understand your part of the shelf. It's a mm-hmm. big store. But if you zoom in, if you understand how to zoom in on the on the part of the shelf where your book would go, roughly speaking, and it isn't just business, it's like management, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever your shelf is, you need to know who the major players are. And and if they don't sound like you or look like you, you may have it wrong. If you don't mm. understand where you belong in this space, because there's entrepreneurs and there's entrepreneurs. There's kind of the Silicon Valley tech flavored entrepreneur, but then there's the person who wants to open up a dry cleaner. Yeah. And you know, and we call that small business. Or there's there's lots of different types and all of them have their paragons. Like all of them have their like, well, that's the guy in this particular space. That's the woman who that's her book is like the book. Right. And you have to know who those people are. And I'm shocked at how often someone is ready to spend years writing and publishing a book and they don't have the first, they've never looked. They've never gone in as a reader and just been like, what if I wanted diet advice? Like, what diet would I buy? Like, let's go try to find a diet book. And what's already out there. For, yeah. For me. What, right. Yeah. They've yeah. never done it. They've never done it, but they're ready to tell everyone else their diet advice. And it's like, who are, where are you? Like, be a human being. Start first. Does this thing exist? Do you know what I mean? Does yeah. it exist? Try to find it. And, and then use the frustrations and problems that you've run into as inspiration. I can't believe there's no diet book for dog owners or whatever. You, you you look for it, you can't find it, then you know that there's a place. Okay, so it sounds like, um, so it's almost like reverse engineering your book idea out of what is needed or missing, um, you know, where there's opportunity and white space in the market. Uh, but what about your unique value? And I get that there's nothing new under the sun, but then people do have methodologies or research that they've developed or, you know, your, your, um, your, your professional experience, your witty writing style, like where does the special sauce that is you come into play uh, with, with, with this exercise of like trying to find, um, find sp- space for yourself on the shelf? So there's a lot of pieces that you just mentioned very quickly and they're, they're very different. So for yeah. example, you talk about voice, which is kind of a weird thing. And as a ghostwriter, that's something that I have to deal with intimately because I'm writing and people have to believe that that person would say it that way, I guess. And sometimes, uh, you know, an age, if I'm working with an agent, right? So the agent has an author and I'm helping the author write something. Sometimes the agent will flag a sentence and say, this is voicey. This is voicey. Basically meaning like, this is a very particular way of saying something like I used an idiom or something. Would that author say that or would that sound weird coming from them? And we have to think about it. And I, I basing it based on our conversations. I've talked to this person for hours and hours and hours. I feel like they say it that way, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I got it wrong. You know, so there's this idea of like the way you write. The fact is, if you're writing your book, you can't avoid it. I could give you, I could have you read a chapter from another book and say, just write that again. Read it 10 times, read it 50 times, and then go just write it again. Just give me the same exact advice. It would come out in your voice. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, if you wanted to, replicate that other person's voice. So if anything, you fail just by trying to achieve a certain voice. The the voice is going to, your natural voice will only come out when you just explain. As I, the advice I give people who are writing for themselves is like, you're writing an email to an extremely intelligent friend who is completely ignorant. Mm-hmm. So you can't assume that they they already know anything. So all the assumptions of like coming into this, well, you understand what a calorie is. You can't assume any of it, mm-hmm. but but they're very intelligent in the sense that you don't have to repeat things. You don't have to drill them in and use bold, 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 bold. Like I get that thing, like I've got to emphasize it six times. They're not idiots. They just don't know what you know. And your voice will come through if you write in that sense of like an email to a friend. A long email, not like a quick fire off here. But if you, you know, if a friend wrote you and said, "I'm thinking about investing in crypto," um, can you tell yeah. me about crypto? I know you know about crypto. You might write three paragraphs, you know, because you're trying to spare them, <laughs> save their lives. And <laughs> you would, but you would, you would speak in a kind of a natural way, but you'd be clear and you'd get the point across, and you'd, you'd assume that they're intelligent. That's the kind of way you get to your authentic writing voice, and that's really different from your methodology 
how I choose to frame and organize this information. And, and that is where you differentiate yourself. Um, you know, I'm going to divide this up into four big parts. You know, just that decision kind of can shape everything. Whereas another author might have just gone sequentially through material. Like here's a series of tips, or they might have gone chronologically, or you can organize it any number of ways. And that's a huge way that the same advice can feel extremely different uh, when you actually read it. And by the way, I've had m- numerous experiences of, of books that come out at the same time. You may remember there was a movie, uh, Armageddon, and a movie Deep Impact that came out in the same year, both about asteroids hitting the Earth. You're like, how does that happen? Well, well, that happens really all the happens. time. Remember bugs and ants? and or but yeah, they, yeah. It happens in books, too. It happens in books, too. And I've had books uh, come out... Um, you know, where it's the same essential insight, but because they're two very different authors, you get two completely different treatments of the subject. And um, that's natural and that's good. And that's how we differentiate. And if anything, the failure can happen because the book covers and titles and subtitles don't accurately get at what is different about the two books. So the two books kind of look the same. They're both books on habits, you know, but if you really understood the books and what makes them interesting and unique, you would package them very differently. And examples are all right behind you, you know, in terms of how you can present them differently. So in terms of like, if I'm an author and I'm thinking, okay, well, I, 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 I guess I, this is, these are the decisions I would make. I'm going to do it in those four sections, like David said, not chronologically. And then I've got my voice to think about, um, is, if is, we know just as with some people are more engaging, charismatic conversationalists than others, other so certain people have more engaging, entertaining writing voices than others. Um, how can I assess myself and understand like what is strong and what is weak and can a, can a strength in one area compensate for a relative weakness in another? Like if I'm, if I'm just sort of, I don't know if, if, if obviously if I've got, um, a, a truly, um, uh, novel and effective uh, methodology that literally people are in my field are not using. That is a that is a distinctive strength. Um, can that make up for sort of a bland writing voice? And is the opposite also true? Can a sort of a fairly generic prescription be compensated for by a super entertaining writing style? Talk to me about the tension between, um, I guess, content and style. I don't think it's anything that an author would need to worry about. And let me explain why that is. First of all, something that's critical is that these books that succeed don't succeed for the reasons people think. And so when I speak, I would imagine some people are saying, but I have an exception to whatever Dave just said. And I would say that exception is probably not the exception you think it is. So for (laughs) example, there are books of the most generic advice that are enormously successful. I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus, but there are books that are you would read, it's kind of like when you see those white paintings, you know, I could paint that, you know, the modern art kind of thing. I could paint that. You couldn't, but that idea. So people will pick up a book. That's a huge bestseller about turn your life around, get, yeah. you know, go yeah. do something I, with yourself. And they'll read it and say, this is, this is so boring. This is the same generic stuff. That must mean that because this person's a funny writer, that that overcomes the fact that this is really banal. That's that you could come away with that lesson. What they're not understanding is that book is not why the book sells. The book sells because that person is an extremely popular blogger. Uh And they might be an extremely popular blogger or YouTuber or whatever because of their humor and because Uh of their personality. But if you subtracted that audience of people who just love anything that that person does and just put that book out into the marketplace without that built-in audience, it would have flopped. It would have absolutely flopped because it is banal and there is no overcoming banal advice. There is. You know, what I notice is that you can really, you know, there are books where uh, the common complaint that I often hear when people are sort of comparing themselves to their peers and, and, um, is that, oh, that book, you know, it should have been an article. Like how can you make a whole book out of that subject? That's an article at best and it's so bloated and blah, blah, blah. And yet look at it. It's been 52 weeks on the New York times bestseller list selling like hotcakes. Um, and so, uh, that, when you really hear it is when you listen to the audiobook. That's when you hear, my God, this person has just said the same thing 75 times in the same chapter. And it's just literally the same words over and over again. Um, so, but that speaks to the importance of platform. It's what, what, you know, what you were just getting at. But you can't learn from that. That's useless to know. Yes. If you had a million YouTube people in your audience, you also could sell some books. Congratulations. 
Could that person have sold more books to their YouTube audience if they had a better book? Sure. But it is a distortion because we're thinking about what, what do prospective authors do differently to be more successful. And mm -hmm. what I'm saying is you have to really understand why a book succeeded if you're going to take any lessons from it, especially if those lessons are counterintuitive. The intuitive answer is better advice will be a better book. Mm -hmm. If you see a book with lousy advice or boring advice and it works really, really well, instead of saying, oh, it's because he's funny, right? right? And say like, oh, well, let's find out why this book succeeded. And two seconds on Google and you'll quickly find out like, oh, this person runs a multi-level marketing scheme with 18 million people forcing their friends to buy conditioner. That's not, you know what I mean? The book is just another piece of merch. You don't learn lessons on t-shirt design from like a Guns N' Roses t-shirt. It's because of Guns N' Roses. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, but there you are books out there that are, that are super popular that. that I've listened to on audiobook and, you know, found like, gosh, this is super repetitive. But, you know, it's not it's not bad. It is good advice. It's just thin. It's just thin and it's padded. And meanwhile, um, the author is an extremely effective um, builder of their brand and um, getting their message out there. And I think that there's something in the simplicity of a book like that that actually makes it more um appealing to certain types of readers you know that i think that okay sometimes so that's, that's sometimes fair. people get they they you know they think that like ah i have to write like you know a phd thesis and get super deep and you know sometimes it really is about simplifying str you know streamlining and um and having one clear i clear bell ringing it you know loudly again and again and again that kind of thing tell me about that okay so now we're talking about simplicity which is a little bit different then because, you know, you think about a book that is extremely, extremely simple, like Who Moved My Cheese, which is a right. huge, huge bestseller and still sells a billion, trillion copies. And that couldn't be simpler. And it is what we call a parable, which is basically a sort of a fictional story that is intended to convey a basic lesson. And these are almost always not organic successes. They are books that are tied to wildly popular speaking platforms and driven by bulk sales. There's all kinds of mechanisms to explain why grown people are reading a book about mice, or rats looking for cheese. Um, you know, I picked it up in a bookstore and I, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, yeah, is this, in the, this is in the adult section. I couldn't, I didn't understand at all what I was looking at. I learned. Um, but the point is, is that we talk about, when you talk about well, clarity resonating with certain readers, maybe. But I can only think about, as a craftsperson, I can only think about in terms of the scope of possibilities for you as you are with your platform, as it is, what is the best possible product? Mm. That's all I can talk about. If mm. you start moving both elements at the same time, like, well, what if I had a million more followers? You know, what if I got a TV show? That You can't work on the book and also work on your platform at the same time and kind of juggle them together. You have to figure out what we're talking about here. Is it better to repeat your point over and over? It is not. And I, I challenge you to find a reader Especially, again, you'll find positive Amazon reviews, but often if you read them, you'll find that they're people who don't read books at all. This is the first book I've read since high school, and it totally blew me away. And it's like, yeah, for that person, I'm glad your platform got them to open the book, and it made it very easy for them to digest. But that's not really a target to aim for. You know, that sort of remedial, like, if this is the first book you've ever read, I've got some amazing stuff for you. Apparently, getting a full night's sleep does wonders for your complexion. Oh, wow, this is amazing. So that, you know, again, like, that's not a bad thing. Those people really should be told that, you know, if you've never read a book before and you, this is your first book of advice, I'm so glad you're learning about things like habits and routines and effectiveness and setting goals. And that's all fantastic. But you can't, unless you do have such a, like, for example, if you had a colossal platform, if you came to me and said, I'm, you know, name a celebrity and I want to write, write a book for my teenage audience, um, you know, they're really uh, ambitious and I want to help them succeed in life and give them like really good advice, we would be going back to basics. This is not an audience that's read a lot of books before or read or certainly read a lot of book, books of advice. And if you have Billie Eilish writing a book of advice, I would say like, let's go really, really broad. Like what are some basics I mm. want you to know, like avoiding, you know, toxic relationships, kinds of basic, basic kinds of things and keep it clean, keep it simple, repeat yourself. Absolutely. Cause these people, you know, they may not be reading closely. So those mm -hmm. are all factors to consider if you have a huge audience. And you're thinking about like, what would make the greatest impact on the world that I really could get 50 million people to buy a book. That is not the question that is facing probably any, anyone listening to this podcast. You know, we're dealing with constraints of 
Maybe you have a mailing list with 10,000 people, maybe yeah. 50,000 people. You're not, a, you're not a celebrity. And the fact is, if you are a celebrity, you're probably working with someone like me. Do you know what I mean? For someone who has to kind of break out, the books that genuinely break out, and I don't have, I don't have exceptions to this rule, and I'm always looking for them, are really, really great books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see crappy books winning without the platform part of it. Yeah. And yeah. I mean crappy Absolutely. by being repetitive, by saying the same thing over and over, by padding the final 10 chapters. When the book, when you don't like the book and it is not good, a good book and you're wondering why X, Y, and Z, you're just not seeing the whole story. I promise. So, um, again, just really drilling into, you know, how can people look at the kind of like the constellation of things that make up who they are and the work that they have done throughout their career? We know that there's so much to consider, you know, leveraging in the service of their book, what to include, what to leave out, um, what to focus on, what to forget about, which aspect of their you know, their base or their, you know, their, their ex- experience, um, to bring to the foreground. Can you give me any sort of like rules of thumb as to, you know, h- how to make those decisions? Absolutely. I can tell you exactly what to do. Thank you. Me. Um, <laughs> cause it's really, I hear that complaint, but it's actually not a problem. It's a problem that isn't a problem when you actually dig into it. So one common thing is this, I'm an expert. People come to me and pay me money for my help with whatever. And they, I blow their minds. And generally speaking, most people don't read books. And most people are, are ignorant of kind of all the general knowledge that's out there. So they come to you and you say, get your full night's sleep. <laughs> Two other things. Holy cow. They work with you for three months. You've transformed their lives. Because, you know, the, the Pareto principle, you know, you get 80% of the results from 20% of the changes. So you, you've given them like the lowest hanging fruit. And you think you're a genius. You've invented everything. And then you come and say, I've got, now I'm ready for the book. I've got so much stuff. And it's like, well, you've got so much stuff or you've helped so many people in the same exact way. And what you find is when you actually outline all that stuff, it's like three, t- three tools. You're the good tools, but three low, th- three low hanging fruit. And then you have a whole book to fill. That's, that's the, by far the most common thing. And people, because they've never actually sat and re- written down before, didn't realize that really they were kind of saying the same thing, the same three pieces of advice in many, many different ways or supporting them with many different examples or, or research. But ultimately, there's just three pieces of advice. And so this idea that the book is just spilling, unless you're Tim Ferriss, your book is not just spilling over with all kinds of useful stuff that no one has ever heard of before. And he did that a while back in Four Hour Work Week. Things have changed. People have swarmed that area of personal development. And you, you can't just look in some journals and immediately find all this great stuff no one's ever heard of before. Everyone's scouring for those kinds of insights. So no, you're going to have a hard time filling your book. It's not that there's too much. That said, when I talk about packaging, which is what do we call it? How do we frame it? How do we sell this as a product? That upsets people because, for example, I'm calling this book the four-hour work week, but it's not just about working less. It's also about X, Y, Z, all these other things that are going to be useful for my reader. That's okay. That's okay. That's for people, because you've got a lot of room in the book. You don't have a lot of room on that title and subtitle. And the example I use is you're driving down the highway and you see one of those billboards and it shows a, you know, a gigantic hamburger and you're hungry and you go in, you don't think it's just like a hamburger store. You know what I mean? Like they have other stuff, even McDonald's has other, they have salads, they have, but if you saw the menu, on that billboard and just like rows and rows of text, everything that the diner offers, you wouldn't even notice it. It would just be a big blur of words and you wouldn't be able to process it. In the same way, yes, we could just put, and people have tried, like 55 topics crammed onto the cover, you know? So like, it's gotta all be on the cover. They gotta know all this stuff. All my genius ideas are in this book, but it just becomes nothing. It just becomes nothing. So when you package it, you have to really have a very distinct hook you have to have a very distinct thing that's going to grab someone's attention. But the book itself, no, you are not going to have way too much stuff. You can put all the stuff you want in there. As long as you organize it in a logical way, I want there to be more stuff. As you said, the real challenge is usually that you get through all the good stuff in three chapters, and then you have to kind of vamp for another nine chapters. You have room. Don't worry about it. Worry about how you're going to grab the reader's attention when they're scrolling through Amazon results or walking through a bookstore. 
That's so interesting, David. So what you're saying is the book can be complex and actually needs to be complex, multi-layered, have a lot of content inside of it, but it mustn't present as a complex thing. It has to have some kind of sticky, easy handle to grab onto for that reader to understand, ah, this is what I'm going to get out of it. That's exactly right. And it's usually in the form of, of a solution to an intractable problem. It is not going to be, how do you install a light bulb? Even if you don't know how to install a light bulb, installing a light bulb is a pretty straightforward thing. Once you've done it once, it's done. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, habits are messy and complicated and mm -hmm. you can develop good habits and then realize you've developed a new bad habit and you kind of have to go back to the well. Working on your art, your creativity, you know, these are thorny, messy problems. No one can write a book that solves productivity. Oh, well, now I get up every morning at the same time, do all my work by 6 a.m. and hit the beach. There's no such thing. It's always going to change. You're always going to need someone else's perspective. That's the, so those kinds of promises that mm -hmm. really kind of hook into something you know readers are grappling with, you know, their anxieties about their body, about their health, about their mental, physical well-being, about their careers. It's got to offer me a direction. Like things might be better if I buy that book. And th these are things that are perennial complaints for human beings. They're always, 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 always going to be problems that we are seeking solutions for. Even if the solutions are all around us, we're always going to be out there looking for something new. And um, in the in the case of, uh, I mean, sometimes we you know, we do have new um, uh, advances in, in neuroscience, in you know, positive psychology coming out, or discovering the, that the brain is actually more malleable than we knew. You know, these things kind of open up a whole entire field of study and, um, and, and then opportunity for various different voices and experts to find their own kind of unique hook on this emerging field that they, they haven't necessarily developed, but, but that is kind of bubbling up in the public consciousness. That's right. There's always another angle, but again, if you actually look closely at any of those books, you will find that the advice is really the same advice. They can give you all the stuff about the brain is malleable or maybe it's not malleable. And I've, I've had, because I've been doing this for so long, I started in publishing in 2004. And I read these books before I even started. I've seen waves where it's like, this is the new thing, you know, and then there's waves against it. Remember when people said that the brain is malleable? It's not malleable. <laughs> this new research, you know, we had a huge thing called the replication crisis in social sciences. And a lot of big business books were built around these experiments that were done in a fairly sloppy way, which no one would have noticed if they hadn't become big best-selling books, giving people these kinds of, look at this study, you know, such and such. And I, I'm not, again, I don't want to name any names. And, and then people went and said, you know, I looked at these statistics. This is all wrong. There's no effect at all. Or actually it shows the opposite of what you, you said. This advice is completely wrong. Right. But even that wave of correction, if you actually boil down what they're saying, it's still the same advice. Get your eight hours of sleep. Breathe deeply. You know what I mean? Drink enough water. And, you know, that's just oversimplification. But generally speaking, you're not actually getting fundamentally different glimpse of the universe in terms okay. of these basic things. Okay, that depresses me, frankly. But... Um... <laughs> Because I love books and I love ideas and I love the idea that, uh, you know, human beings are evolving and growing and that we are learning truly new stuff. And maybe, maybe that's a fallacy that you're just going to strip away from me. Um, I don't mean to do that. It's, <laughs> there are little advances. And if you ask any academic, you know, they, you know, mm -hmm. the example, I feel like there was a famous cartoonist who did one kind of showing like you're in college, you kind of catch up to general knowledge and then you're in master's degree and then PhD. And then like, if you're lucky, right at the edge of human knowledge, you put like a little dent in your whole career of working on, you know, advanced topics, you put a little dent of like something new. And that's what an academic strives for. But for some people, I've had people tell me in all seriousness, I've read 10 books on sales and now I'm ready to like write a book on it. Like all they had to do was just read 10 books for general readers and they've already discovered the new secret to X, Y, or Z. And I mean, with a straight face, you know, 25 years old, they're ready to reinvent a topic because they read 10 books that were read, written by other people who had read 10 books. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, a lot of it is repetitive. But here's the thing. I don't care that it's repetitive because if it doesn't sink, get through to me because of the way it's presented or because of who the author is, it's useless. Right. And if it does get through to me because this author speaks my language and relates to me and uses examples that I can relate to 
and all the little pieces that make a, a great book a great book. And anyone listening to this, they've had books that have changed their lives. That's probably why they're interested in this. You know, to make a book. If, if, if you've never liked books and haven't changed your lives, uh, why would it matter to you? So it's mm-hmm. Why? Why that book? What was it about the author and the way they spoke and the examples they used and all those intangibles that it actually made you do something differently? Because I certainly am not the same person I was after having read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People right. or any of the other books that There's had an There's something in what the author puts forward that kind of unlocks understanding, makes the penny drop, opens your mind, right. allows it to be absorbed instead of just being words that you're pushing through your eyeballs. That's right. A great now, teacher. You don't you don't mm-hmm. say to a teacher, well, you didn't involve in that algebra. Right. You know what I mean? You're a great teacher because you taught me algebra. That's that's the difference. So David, what would you say to people who say, Well, I think that what is uh, you know, what I really need to put into my book is my story because my struggle, my experience, my growth, you know, sort of arc, um, the things that I went through and the, you know, the ways, the battles that I fought and the things I overcame. Um, and I'm not speaking about a narrative memoir here, by the way, I'm speaking still about we're in the prescriptive space where this is an advice book, but I really think that I need to tell my story and people will learn from it. Um, and that is what is going to sell books. I, I already know what you're going to say in response to this. And I want to hear you say it. (laughs) Cause I'm sick of saying it. Go. Humility is really important. Okay. (laughs) Humility is really important. I, when I was an, I, when I was an editor working for a general uh, imprint that they did all kinds of books, the proposal I would receive over and over again, I mean, daily was I went to Iowa or another prestigious literary uh, MFA program. I traveled to a third world country and my life was changed from all the things I was taught by the poor people of the world before I returned to my suburb. And I want to tell everyone all about it. The parties I had, of course, all their time was spent with other backpackers, but whatever. That memoir exists in a million variations. And the other one was, I got sick. I got a bad sickness. I can't help you with your sickness, but I want to tell you about all the time I spent in the hospital, which is also sad, but it's also like, and yeah, am I supposed to read it? I have cancer. I'm supposed to read it too. I have cancer. Where's my book? Do you know what I mean? Like that sense of like complete blindness to what the reader would get out of spending all that time with your book, 80,000 words. Mm-hmm. Um, they just lose all sight of it. So, so start there, start there. Why would someone read this book? You absolutely need a personal story. Of course, that's how you help us relate to you, but you've got to lead with what it's going to, why it matters to me, you know? And usually it's because you achieved what I want to achieve. If you healed yourself from your cancer <laughs> with raw juices, <laughs> which I, I'm not saying that that's a thing, but there are people who think it's a thing. There if you feel it with raw yeah. juices and you know which juices you used, great. And you know Tell it wasn't a coincidence. Yeah. Right? Tell me the story of it, you know? And like the story behind Lorenzo's oil, that's like a real thing. It's mm-hmm. a real story, although I don't think the people with that rare condition were buying the book to find out about it. But um, you have to lead with why your story matters to me. If your story is like, you ever put on weight? Well, so did I. The end. Yeah, I, I've got a belly. You know what I mean? Like, where's the advice? Get the so one advice. Of, one, the of the, one, of the, one of the areas where, um, uh, where I think um, people, where, where this is most rife, is in the area of, um, like, business memoir or my legacy or, you know, the CEO of a successful sort of, I don't know, manufacturing firm who's going to, write his insights and lessons learned over a long career of, you know, battling from like the ground up to, you know, now I'm a rich guy and I want to tell everybody um, not just about how to do it, but like what it was like for me. And please disabuse anyone of the notion that this is a good idea. (laughs) I mean, if you're Steve Jobs, it's a great idea, right? I wish he had sat down. Um, the problem is, it, it, you know, when someone is a performer at that high level, and I have a list of dream clients, you know, they're people, um, achieve, high achievers of all kinds that I, I think, oh, they only would just call me and I would like help them write the book, telling their story and how they do what they do. Fantastic. So ultimately, if you're the le- leader of a large company, you're not a household name, no one knows who you are, but you're surrounded by people who are really impressed by you. Mm-hmm. I guess you could see why. And the fact is, if you're okay with that, 
if you understand that everyone who worked at GE for the last 30 years is going to want to buy this book, and then 1% of that or one, one tenth of 1% of that buy the book, if that's okay and that's success for you, go write it. Go write it. But if, if no one has heard of you outside of your industry and outside of your particular field, the idea that they're going to pick up your book um, because you're going to talk about how you succeeded, that's really unlikely. Now, I've done books like this that have been successful. And generally speaking, it's because, number one, uh, it's outrageous. And so you're reading it more as an uh, inspirational kind of tale. Like, I was in a gang, and, and this is a real one. I was in a gang, and then I was a successful businessman. You know, that's interesting. Yeah. Now you got my attention hooked. Or I was in the mob, and mm-hmm. I became a, you know, successful in business. Those kinds of things, where it's really like an unusual story that would stand alone in a magazine. Like if you picked up a copy of The Atlantic or something, and someone was like, you know, former con man becomes you know, CEO, you would read that article. But that and goes so in back the sense to of literary like the, interest. This, this idea of like, that, like, where is the value in it for that? Yeah, the value there is in the narrative interest. This is a ripping yarn. Right. This is a tale right. worth telling. And it's got some drama in it, some kind of some ups and downs and thrills and spills. And it's not really about um, a, a roadmap to follow. Except in the sense of inspiration. So when yeah. you read the story of someone, especially someone who succeeded unconventionally, I dropped out of college. Well, I dropped out of college. And I can still succeed. That's really interesting to hear about. Like, did he have famous parents? Oh, he didn't have famous parents. That's because it wasn't nepotism. So people go through a kind of a checklist Mm -hmm. where it's like, can I relate to this? Is there something I might learn from this person's right to the top? Oh, they faked their resume. Now, that may not be good or bad in the larger sense, but that's the kind of thing people take away from this. Like, so-and-so faked his resume to get his first job and then just, you know, knocked everyone's socks off, you know? And those kinds of success stories, people really like to read them, especially if they depict a story that is really unconventional. Because if you tell me that it's like, well, I was raised in a privileged household, went to the best schools in the world, my dad's a famous CEO who invested in my first company, and now I'm an entrepreneur. (laughs) <laughs> Great. Yeah, I probably would be in the same place, right? That's the average person thinks that. I don't think that that's true, by the way. There's plenty of people with who are rich and famous parents and don't start companies. But the fact that most of our most successful entrepreneurs have a variation of that story is not a coincidence. And so the stories that go against that trend are the ones that can work in that sort of business memoir space. So you either got to be just famous in your own right. If Elon Musk wants to write a book about his adventures, yeah. we're all going to read it. We know who he is unconventional in the sense that you were like you made it from the streets and now you're the head of a big company or you've got to you've got to go beyond or you could just be happy with the people from your company and their friends and relatives yeah and maybe you know that's your objective and it's just like i just want to i just want to record what what experience i had and you know put it in a book and and have it exist there for whoever might be interested and i'm not really interested in selling copies the 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 confusion i find is where where people are thinking like well what i should do is try to distill my sort of seven keys to success or or whatever and one of those is like you said get enough sleep um and and it took me from my you know my uh, my, my, my family store to the head of my manufacturing company or, you know, well, yeah. and I hear, by the way, I, have, I know you, you do too. I have this conversation on a weekly basis yeah. and ultimately sure. it always goes back to that thing of not knowing your category. Yeah. These, these are not readers of these kinds of books, generally speaking, mm-hmm. you can sit down and you can pull up a Walter Isaacson on some of the greatest minds of history. You know, one of his biographies, if I can read about Richard Feynman, or I can read about you know, Nikola Tesla or Thomas Edison. I can read about all these people. I can spend that time, 100,000 words, 150,000 words. Why uh, the head of a paper manufacturing company in the Midwest? Why is your insights more interesting to me than, because I have all the books. Yeah. I can go to the library. All It's not like, well, they were all out of copies of the book about Richard Feynman, so you can read my book. No, I actually get to pick that book instead of your book. And that's what they don't seem to understand is that you have to differentiate yourself against all the other books that I could be reading right now. And if you don't even have the remotest argument for that, and you're just basically banking on obscurity and just hoping they don't know about other books, you're out of luck. And that's what I meant when I said, like these kind of banal books that come out from people with huge platforms of, especially platforms made up of Mm non-readers. That's essentially the position they find themselves in. They are marketing to a fresh audience. They're not familiar with other books. They don't know, I didn't know as a teenager that these books even existed. I remember getting a book on organizing. I was like, a whole book on organizing? That's wonderful. I know how to like where to put my stuff. And when I met the author of it, I was like, you don't believe you were the first one. Your book was the first one, Julie Morgenstern. I was like, you you introduced me to this. Uh, you got me hooked on this. And 
but it's true. It's like when you're 18, you don't know any better. That audience is fantastic because you can tell them anything. And for that you know, <laughs> boss at that company, probably most of his employees are like that. Like he can say right. anything to them and they're like, whoa. But in the larger book market, forget it. Right, right, right. So knowing the sophistication of your target reader is really important too. Yeah. Yeah. You have to assume they're sophisticated. You, mm-hmm. you, unless you're famous. Well, unless like, famous, yeah, yeah, you, they're not. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, gosh, so many interesting insights. Um, I, uh, I want to ask you to tell me a little bit more about why you know so much about all of this, David Moldauer, where did you come <laughs> from and what have you done? And tell me some stories from your actual career. Um, uh, yeah. Give me sure, a little sure. bit of your history now. Well, I was, um, I got into publishing not long after college. I wanted to be a playwright and I worked in theater for a few years. And I said that this is, this is just not a viable career path. I want to go into something that is high paying and glamorous and exciting. And so I chose book publishing because I was like, that's obvious. (laughs) Um, And and, um, I went to work at Penguin, uh, which is one at the time it was the big six. Now it's going to be the big four, but it was the big six publishers. And, you know, really out of my element. I was not an English major. I was not one of those literary magazine people. I wasn't a book person because the book, the book publishing community has a very specific culture in New York. And, you know, you read the Parish Review and you drop these certain names and you kind of dress a certain way. And I was just a fish out of water. I did not belong. Um, But I stuck with it and uh, got a job at St. Martin's Press. And it was a very different vibe. St. Martin's is a very cool publisher, very like easygoing, spaghetti at the wall kind of publisher. You know, they'll try anything. And they, um, I was a young editor. They brought me in to work on Let's Go, which are these travel guides published out of Harvard um, for the longest time. And let, and basically St. Martin's would would publish these books for these students. So you had college students, which is quite an experience, I have to say, college students putting out a real like researching everything, traveling to these countries, everything. I had and bought a Let's Go books. guide for sure. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. They used to be <laughs> huge. And so uh, they brought me in to take charge of this process. And I said, I'm happy to do that, but I want to acquire my own books. And the person, my boss, she had the power to basically say, sure, I don't care what you do. Cause that's what St. Martin's press is like. And that's what nice. I and I would just show up and that's unusual. That's extremely unusual. Generally, you have an, a boss who is an editor who will hand you something maybe like, oh, you can you can revise this paragraph. Let's see how you do. And they'll kind of over years of servitude, you'll finally get to acquire something of your own. I mean, 10 years can go by. I've seen you wouldn't believe how people slog away mm. working for two different editors at the same time because you have to share assistance never getting to acquire anything. Here I was like, I'd done nothing. And suddenly I'm bringing whatever I want to the editorial board meeting. And if I could make a good case for that book, they would give me some money to throw at the book and publish the book. Mm -hmm. And so I published a a lot of random books and taught me a lot of useful things. Number one, being able to pitch a book. Because you're going in there, no one's read it. It's 30 people at a table. They're all bored and frustrated. And it's like lunchtime and they're hungry. And you have to very quickly convince everyone this is something that somebody conceivably would buy in a bookstore. And that experience sort of honing the pitch and understanding what people got excited about and also seeing other editors pitch books that then went on to become big bestsellers that you that you know of um, it was very instructive because that's ultimately what a book proposal, proposal is all about. It's 40 pages, but ultimately it's really just that one paragraph right at the top that sells it. And how do you get to that paragraph? Right. Not trivial. And then also being able to talk about a book very quickly in a way that gets people excited to read it. All that training and that the kind of the receiving end that begins when you write the book. But like, do I want this? Would I read this? Can I imagine someone reading this? So that was a great uh, proving ground. And I did a lot of different kinds of books, all nonfiction, with one exception. And one of my authors I had done a book with left to get to take more money elsewhere at Back at Penguin at an uh, imprint that did business books and, and those sorts of books. And his editor quit like the day he was acquired. So he like bought the book and was like, actually I'm leaving. And my author immediately put my name in that and said, Hey, I worked with this guy back at St. Martin's press and you should hire him to be my new editor here. And that worked out. And that was where I started to specialize in, in books of prescriptive, you know, prescriptive, prescriptive nonfiction. And, uh, and then from there, I, so I worked at Portfolio, which is that imprint, and I worked at McGraw-Hill, and 
um, Amazon started a, or announced its intentions to start a publishing imprint in New York. And uh, I immediately got excited about this idea. And yeah. because my feeling at the time was that book publishing had been very, uh, you know, sort of a legacy business and very resistant to change. And looking back on it, I was a pompous, <laughs> arrogant, you know, young person who really didn't know the complexity of the problems that the publishers face. So I had a lot of ideas. I was mostly wrong, but I thought that <laughs> if someone came in with technology and with the web and blah, 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 um, that I would uh, be able to marry the best of both worlds. And so they were hiring, you know, they're they said that they were hiring real for publishing professionals from New York, but combining it with what Amazon does in Seattle with its sort of uh, genre imprints. And so I uh, reached out, I insisted they hire me. <laughs> they agreed for some reason. And so we, I was part of the founding team of that imprint, which famously struggled um, and was often in the newspaper. And I often got yelled at by random people I know in New York who, you know, just telling me, sometimes not knowing I worked there, just telling me how awful Amazon, Amazon was for destroying publishing, not realizing that I was the person that they were so angry with. <laughs> And um, what went wrong there? Well, it's a long story, but um, and the salient point was it takes time. You know, Portfolio, which is the imprint I worked at at Penguin, you know, they were going for about five years before they really found their legs. And I think that for a book publisher, uh, also for an agent, anyone who has to build a list of books, five years is a, is a reasonable timeline. It, it takes a while to, to take a project from inception all the way to market and then have a few of them come out and get some success. So even if you do everything right, you really need to hold a steady tiller for five years. They gave up after about two months oh, because they're coming well, from a tech well, mindset. Well, that's and, very, very fast. And we talked to them. We explained all this, the mindset, you know, to build a publisher. And I wouldn't say that it was really heard, but when Barnes and Noble announced that they would not carry the books, uh -huh. the entire mood shifted. And it wasn't long before things kind of, you know, they tried to figure out another way of doing it. And they've gone on to great success. The funny thing about Amazon publishing is that they sell a ton of copies. It's just because they are so ostracized, I think, by all the mechanisms that we find out about books through, like libraries and independent bookstores and magazines and journalists and da 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 The authors, someone can write a collection of short stories, which is like the dream, like selling a collection of short stories and sell 20,000 copies. But no one has ever heard of them. Hmm. And that's very painful because, especially in literary fiction, it's entirely about, let's be honest, like winning an award, having your English professor see your name, being vindicated. Like none of that happens. You're, no one proclaims you anything if mm -hmm. you're not part of the ecosystem of publishing. And so you can sell lots and lots of copies onto some Kindles scattered around the world. But um, that satisfaction, you know, that especially in literary fiction, that's so important. That influence is missing. Um, but I was not, I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't stick around to see what happened. Well, two they, months they is an awfully short time to be well, seen writing for, for on the wall. <laughs> yeah, I was there for a long time. I was there for, uh, for a few years. But the, uh, the shift, the shift uh, away from let's uh, bring in the biggest authors. You know, I acquired Deepak Chopra and we had, um, we had all kinds of names. Penny Marshall, we had all these big names, Tim Ferriss. Um, and we had contracted with Houghton Mifflin, which is a traditional publisher, to distribute the books. Mm -hmm. So Amazon's thinking was if Houghton Mifflin is publishing these books technically even though we're the ones acquiring them and and they're kind of putting the book they put their little icon on the side the color phone then marginable will allow it I don't I don't think they banked for how uh, angry the people running Barnes and Noble were about this and uh, it didn't fool anybody I see so so the so the, the mood shifted after two months, but you guys limped along for a couple of years and then exactly you we tried away. Lots I got of it okay. things and tried to you know figure out what worked and I think they really did figure out something that works for Amazon mm -hmm. but that wasn't what I wanted to do so um I want to shift gears here for a second and ask you about the writing process itself, um, the creative process. And I, and I want to hear your thoughts on, um, on your, your own process. Cause I know that you're a ghostwriter, as you said, so you're, you're a writer. Um, and, and also the advice that you give to authors about their writing process. That's the only prompt I'm going to give you. Cause I know you're just going to run with it. So, okay, let's run <laughs> no, with writing no specific question there. Just, just talk. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd be happy to. So the first thing I always do working on a book proposal. Now, I'll specify, you don't always need a book proposal. Some publishers don't need it. Sometimes you, you sell a book on a cocktail napkin. Like, I want to do a book on X. It's like, sure, 
great. Here's your, here's your advance. Here's your contract. And uh, if you're self-publishing or hybrid publishing, so there's, but it's still useful to think about this process. Mm -hmm. However, you're going to write the book. The planning phase is crucial. And right. In our company, we do a, something a called book. a book plan, which essentially contains all the components of a book proposal for the exact same reason. Without that roadmap in place, you're just going to wind up wandering across the meadow. Exactly. And call it a book plan if you, if you prefer. But ultimately, what you're doing is figuring out what is this thing going to be so that we can keep on track and, right. and, and know we've arrived at our destination. Right. And for that process, I always start with the competitive analysis. Mm -hmm. So that I am crystal clear on where this thing is going to go, like where on the shelf, I'm going to put it right between the power of habit and right between atomic habits. It's going to go right here. Can I picture the author on a panel with those authors, with Charles Duhigg and James Clear? Like, would it make sense? Or would it be like, who's that person on the stage? Figuring out where it's going to fit. That's kind of the outer boundaries. Just like you, you carve out the marble before you, you make the shape of the person in the marble. You kind of like, here's the marble. And get it out of the quarry. That's for me the competitive analysis. And from there, I assemble all of the content, all of the content. And I call it buckets. That's what works for me because a bucket can be a bucket of information can really be anything. A bucket can be a chapter. It might just be a paragraph. You really don't know until you dug into it and you also you understand who you're explaining it to. Because if I'm explaining Bitcoin to my mom. That's the mm -hmm. paragraph version. But if I'm explaining it to an institutional investor, that's a chapter version, the same bucket. What is Bitcoin? You know, And once you've got all your buckets and you understand where this is going to go, you start thinking about who the, the market for this is. Who am I speaking to? I always say, assume they're intelligent. I always say that. And of course, and I just mentioned the exception. If you're you know, big famous pop star writing a book and you know your audience is, is young and, you know, you can't make that necessarily. You have to maybe simple it down. Or in the case of Who Moved My Cheese, if you're writing a book that lets, I mean, in my opinion, no offense to anyone involved, but I think those books, those parables work because the CEO is very frustrated with their workforce, which is largely uneducated and mm. thinks like, I've got to get these people to be responsible. And so you write this very simple story that's a, parable about a raccoon that's responsible and then gets a promotion and 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 whether or not that's infantilizing and patronizing the ceo looks at it and says yes that's the level of my employees at the front line those are my retail employees they could read this 65 page story about a raccoon that may or may not be true but he'll buy fifty thousand copies and tell right. the other ceo he knows to buy fifty thousand copies now do the people like it or not i don't know some people like that book i don't know but that beyond those weird exceptions where you have some fixed idea about who you're talking to, and they wouldn't understand anything if it didn't have a talking raccoon in it. Aside from that, you have to assume your reader is very intelligent. And that's why writing like it's an email, for me, is just the easiest rule of thumb. Because you know how it is when you're trying to explain something complicated to a friend. You don't want to offer too much detail. You want to make sure you explain everything they need to understand. Like if you had an argument at work, you ran into a friend from college you haven't seen in years, they know you but they don't know your friends from work and you want to unburden yourself, right? So you're like, okay, you know, Brenda works in the accounts department and she's like this. And you kind of position them, you explain things, but you don't worry about voice. You're not going to get into the weeds. Voice. Yeah, right. Yeah, you don't get into the weeds, but you also don't worry about voice. You don't worry right. about how you're saying it. Right, you know, right. Someone's like, I want, you know, one client was like, I want it to be funny. Can you make it funny? It's like, don't make it funny. If you're funny, it'll come out. If you're funny, you can't help it. If you're not funny, trying to be funny is the cringiest thing you can possibly do. Just explain it. And if you have any natural wit, it will emerge because you're writing a lot of words. So there's no keeping it from emerging. And then editing can also help sharpen things and make them pop and make them memorable. But at first, just try to explain it clearly to someone who really does not understand. And then later on, a friend can always say, you know, you didn't actually have to explain what atoms are. I think most people know what atoms are. Are you sure? Yeah. Jim, you also know what an atom is? All right, let's 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 just assume we know what atoms are. That kind of fiddling happens at the end. 99% of the time, your instinct about what the average person would know is, is, is fine, and they can always look it up. And people get frustrated if you go overboard you know, right. in terms of explaining these kinds of things. So just use that friend as the, as the metric in your mind. How would I explain this to my friend? Okay. So, um... Okay, so we're we're there. We're we're now we're dealing with buckets. But where? How do you right. go from buckets of ideas and things I want to say to actually 
a manuscript draft. Right. I mean, I so, know you, you, we can get into like things like, I don't know, um, uh, rhythm and routine or hacks to get the words out or, you know. W- yeah, no, no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. So you've got your buckets, you've got your, and all of this, as you're planning the book out, all of this can happen at the same time as you're thinking about like, well, what's the overarching idea? Now, this is a book about how we need to take more vacations. Now, what's the big idea that ties all this together? And that helps, but it, I don't rush it. I don't rush it. The buckets are what is most important because, you know, for example, someone came to me and said, you know, I've got this big idea, but one of the components of the idea, one of the buckets is creativity. And I said, okay, great. Do you know anything about creativity? No, but it's really important. It's really important to this larger problem. Right. But what are you going to say about it? Oh, research. And I was like, what research? Research about creativity? (laughs) I've written now like three books on creativity. There's no research. There's nothing like, there's no tips on creativity. You can back up your own tips by cherry picking things, but like, there's no like research on creativity. That's not a thing. What are you going to tell people to do if you've never painted anything or written anything or come up with a product or anything that you could call creative where you can draw on your own experience? You know, if you read Creativity Inc., which is a book by the co-founder of Pixar, when he gives advice, he then backs it up by saying, like, this is what we actually did to make Toy Story. And this problem came up and we sat down. We did this thing where we talked to each other and then this solution was proposed. And you mm-hmm. can see how this methodology plays out. Mm-hmm. So he's got a bucket, right, <laughs> on creativity. But if you've never done anything like that, Your bucket's don't empty. make a bucket you can't fill. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so figuring out what the – writing out what you think the buckets are and then looking at them really asking, like, how much do I have? How much material do I have? You know, like a stand-up comedian, like how much have I got on traffic? Traffic, traffic, uh, stoplights, you know? You got to have material. If you don't have material, don't put the bucket in the book. And authenticity matters in terms of what you're putting in the bucket, but complete fresh ground, you know, originality doesn't necessarily matter. You just have to have something to say about it that... Yeah, you have to be able to explain it to me. If you can't Mm -hmm. explain it to me in a book of prescriptive advice, don't put it in your book. Now, there are situations where you're going to do more research. But mm-hmm. don't be too ambitious. If you're if you're a journalist and you, for example, let's say you're curious about Bitcoin, it's eight years ago, whenever this is first starting, and you want to write a book, and I actually did a sold a proposal on Bitcoin, um, but no one knows about it, right? So now you're okay. I'm going to go look into it, and then you can make the buckets of well, who are the, who created it? Like, what's the technology behind it? What are some potential uses? Oh, I can talk to an investor and ask them what they think. I can talk to a regulator. You see what I mean? So you can figure out where the buckets are going to be, even if you haven't filled them yet. You can see how you would fill them through research that you actually know how to do. You actually know the kind of person you would talk to, how you would reach them, why they would talk to you. All those questions come. If you don't know, if you don't have the first clue how you're going to fill a bucket, don't put it in your book. It's Mm -hmm. not going to happen during the writing of your book. It's it's too much. Better to change the scope. And so the reason we do the book of buckets now is because you realize, oh, I thought this book was about X, but when I put in the buckets I was interested in talking about and they kind of got bigger, and those other buckets were empty. I removed them. This book is actually over here. I thought it was about habits in general, but it's actually about like working out. It's mm-hmm. actually about the habits around working out because I don't really want to talk about the habits of writing my novel. And so you know what I mean? So like you, you start to zero in on the buckets that are really exciting to you. Each bucket should feel really exciting because writing a book is really hard. It's a lot of hard work. And if the idea of writing that bucket fills you with dread because you're like, oh, God, what am I going to say about creativity? Don't put it in your book. They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear what you dredge up. No one wants to hear what you dredge up. If it's boring for you to write, it. it's probably going to be boring to read. Right. Exactly. So that's what the buckets are for. Once you have your buckets, what I do is I use software called Scrivener, which is very popular writing software on PC and Mac. And each bucket becomes a, a card. And I start to fill them out and then eventually become chapters. I start to figure out like these two buckets belong together. This bucket is actually two chapters. I'm going to split it. And that's all very easy to do with Scrivener. And I also sometimes use outlining software. Um, but one way or the other, I, I start to figure out what those plans. Now, the plan can change and a proposal can change. There are times during the writing of a book where the, you know, the proposal has an outline the publishers agree to, but you can go back to the publisher and say, actually, this chapter is like 12,000 words. What, what if we split it along this line? And they're like, that yeah, doesn't care, great. You know, mm-hmm. and vice versa. What if I combine chapters three and six? They're kind of the same thing. Great. But but you needed a plan. You need to go in with a plan. And I do that in Scrivener. And that way, and you can keep splitting, right? So once the bucket becomes a chapter, I can then split that bucket into eight subheads. 
And then it becomes so much easier because once you're writing at the scale of 250, 500 words, where you just have to explain one thing or tell yeah. one story or use one piece of research, then each of those pieces of content, you just sit down and you do it. Okay, so I have this research study, and here's the point I want to make about it. Great. Okay, so I put that there. I've got it open. I've got my little book. I know, I know the word counts because it lets you say like what your targets are. You know how long the book is. You've divided it up by that number of chapters, right? 60,000 words. It's 12 chapters. You know how many words you need per chapter. Then you've got eight pieces of the chapter. It's just simple math. Divide that chapter that's supposed to be 5,000 words into 10 parts, 500 words per chapter. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it gives you a sense. This should be roughly 500 words. Then you just stand and do it. And like, like an email, I've got to explain to my friend in 500 words why this cool study leads to this point. And I love that you said, you know, just approach it like an email because I've actually worked with some people um, for whom writing in email is so much more comfortable than sitting down in front of a Word document and so much more freeing. And I find that for myself sometimes, I mean, especially in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so of, of my life as I've been, you know, running my own company, a, a lot of the writing that I do is in email. You know, I, 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 I write lengthy, explanatory, you know, illuminating, whatever, encouraging <laughs> or argumentative. I write a lot of emails and the emails are pretty, you know, meaty sometimes. And that is a medium in which <clears throat> you know that you're writing to one person. There's a, there's a recipient of that email. And as you sit down and, and it can only be so long, your email is not going to be 5,000 words. I mean, I hope it isn't because um, who's going to read that. So that, that alone can be uh, a little bit of a hack. I, I have encouraged people when they're getting trouble, when they're finding trouble, um, having trouble, just even getting started with a chapter. Um, I will say, answer me these questions by email. And that can kind of like unblock your process. So what are some other, you know, you said writing a book is hard, then you got to sit down and do it. What are some, what are some hacks that have worked for, for some of your clients or for you, people who, who just really, you know, have difficulty with the bum in the chair problem? Oh, bum in chair. That's a tough one. And the simple, the things that work for me, number one, going first, got to come first. Once I get started on something else, I'm not going to return. When you're writing, what you're doing, I think of it as juggling. You're going to take this fact. You're going to take this fact. Now I've got, I've got them all up in the air. You know, and this is why concentration, right? People don't, don't interrupt me. It's because we're keeping all these pieces and we're trying to click them together. But you can't put them down while, during this process. We're right. building one of these chunks, tying the story of a particular study or whatever, make personal experience, the lesson you drew. You've got all the pieces in the air. And all the fun is in figuring out the best way to click them together and how to tell it. How, how do I explain this in a way that you really ex understand how exciting this insight is? That is hard work. It's like when you show up to the gym, it's like you're not going to start on the bicep curls. You're going to, oh, I'll do the squat. I hate it. I'm just going to get it over with. And that's, it's squat to start writing. You got to put all that stuff in your head. So do it first. To get it first, I use an app called Focusmate, which is a paired writing service. So basically, or, or any service, you can do any kind of work. It just pairs you in a video chat with someone else who's also working for a session. So you schedule it on your calendar. You say tomorrow at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., and 9 a.m., I want hour-long sessions. And it will automatically pair you with people. It's a lot of students, a lot of writers. And they'll pop up just like they are now. And you'll say, hey, how's it going? What are you working on? Oh, I got to write 500 words on this story. What are you working on? I'm studying for a test. Great. Have a great session. And then you just work. Do the hour at the end, how to go. Oh, great. And for whatever reason, it's crazy because they're a complete stranger and it doesn't matter, you know, what whether you work or not. For some reason, it triggers that little part of the brain that people get sometimes from going to a cafe, which oh. was very tough during COVID. So this was, yeah. this was an important tool for me for going to a co-working space or being at a company. It just provides a co-worker and there's they're working. Yeah. And if they can sit still and you see all their textbooks and things. <laughs> if they can do that, you're like, all right, all right, I'll just sit here and do my work. That's so cool. I've never heard of that app and uh, or that service, and I think I should try it. It's like parallel play, right? Like t two people head down side by side together. That's right. Put together but apart. <laughs> and, and, you know, people are fans of the, what the Pomodoro technique, mm -hmm. which is where you set a timer. But the problem is, is that that doesn't, it's just a thing on my desk. And, and when I hit that moment where I get stuck, 
which happens a lot if you're writing and you kind of don't know the next thing, the solution is there. All you got to do is sit there for 15 seconds. You'll you'll get through the stuckness. But that 15 seconds is excruciating. Mm-hmm. And if all I've got with me is that little timer, I'm probably going to go get a cup of coffee and chat with my spouse. And, you know, half an hour later, it's like, oh, it's almost lunchtime and I've lost the morning. Yeah, I tried the timer thing and sometimes it works. And very often I get distracted without even realizing I am. And I'm, I'm off on doing some other little random thing and like, oh, look, 15 of my 20 minutes have elapsed and I am not writing. So Right, right. So having that person yeah. there, you okay. can't not be aware when a video chat is open. You cannot yeah. act like you're alone. They're watching. They're not watching you. They don't really care. Yeah. But they're there. They're, there's a person. The witness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The witness to your struggle. <laughs> Um, what do you think about voice dictation? Well, you know, it's funny. David Pogue, who um, was a tech editor at the New York Times for the longest time, he wrote an article about that years ago when it was still in its early days. And there was an, a- an application called Dragon, which was like the only mm-hmm. way to do good voice dictation. And he basically said that he had gotten such bad RSI, which I have a little bit. I have to normally wear one of these um, sleeves. Um, he had switched to voice dictation entirely. And there are um, novelists who will just go on a hike, not in New York City, but if you live in like the desert and and just like rattle off a chapter, I can't imagine. I can't even conceive. It's just not the way I work. I'm constantly referring to materials and moving pieces around as I go because these concepts need they, they, the concepts need to be presented in a way that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm not gonna keep writing when I know that this thing needs to go here and I need to check a fact here. Mm-hmm. I need everything in front of me, minority report style, you know, where he's got all the different screens and those gloves. And like, <laughs> That's how I'm at the desk. And I, I couldn't do it with voice, although it sounds so convenient because then I could go for a walk and get my exercise in. Yeah. Instead, I'm on a bicycle chair. I actually use voice dictation sometimes when I'm trying to find a simple and um, uh, elegant way to express something. Um, so for me, for certain types of things, it's not great for, like you said, synthesizing research or, um, or any of that. But when, when you're trying to express something ineffable, um, I often find that it comes to me when I'm, my body is moving. Um, and then I'll use the, the voice notes app and then, but then that becomes a piece that needs to be integrated at the desk. And it's not the thing itself. It's, it's a piece of the thing itself. What I find that some people, um, where the, the, the biggest, um, pitfall with voice dictation is that it's too easy to generate thousands of useless words. That's my nemesis. Yeah. Extra words. And, and I completely see how that would happen. I mean, I, I'll, I'll say, I will say things out loud after they're written, especially things like introductions. Mm-hmm. Then I feel like it really does need to present in a certain way. And my ear will be very helpful. But as far as generating useless words, you know, one of the most common things that will happen, especially for a book project that has been gestating for a long time, and someone comes to me for help, and they'll say, oh, I've got all this stuff, and reams and reams of material. you got to look at all of this. I generally don't look at any of it, um, because it tends to be the same thing over and over again. Because when you're speaking, you're not really aware that you've already said this thing before in just a slightly different way, because you've never really laid it out. And so you've generated all this material, but if you look through it, there's a very famous um, story from the New Yorker. It became a movie called Joe Gold's Secret about this guy who kept talking about this book he was working on. This like in the thirties, told every famous, he knew all the famous artists in Greenwich Village and talked about this book and he would leave notebooks in everyone's home because he was, he was often homeless. Said, Hold on to this. This is part of my great work. And then they found out like after he died, it was all like the same crazy stuff over and over and over and over again. Just like, you know, sort of weird poetry over and over again. He was just repeating himself, but that's all of us. Like I, I yeah. do too. I'll look back. If I don't check my blog post carefully, my newsletters, I will repeat the same thing. Sometimes word for word without realizing it. Like, I, already, yeah. I already did a whole thing on that. You know what and I mean? And we often, so, we speak circuitously. We don't, we right. don't like lay out an idea in a well, you know, in a way that where one thought progresses neatly to the next and where an idea builds on itself as you go. We're, we're, we're wool gathering, you know, we're, we're looping back. We're, we're not finishing our point We're you know, we're treading back over old ground and that happens so much. So I really, I, 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 I shudder when I hear about all these sort of like, you know, speak your book sort of services and do this in a weekend and, you know, just talk for an hour. That's chapter one, talk for another hour, that's chapter two. And it's painful for me because what the problem is, once you've got that useless track laid, it's very painful to rip it up. 
right? It's very painful to go back and edit and say like, mm, actually 90% of this is bullshit. And it's just, I'm just going to struggle with trying to make it better. And like, no, the answer is snippety snip. Like, <laughs> that's exactly right. And, that, and that, by the way, that's why I find the bucket so useful because mm -hmm. you can very quickly carve right. up all Right. Like, that oh, stuff. look, this goes in no bucket. Right. And what will happen is, well, <laughs> well, that's true. But even if it goes in a bucket, what you will find once you isolate it, all the meandering circuitous stuff, you realize, oh, it, this is the same thing six different times. So right. Once you've actually isolated it, when it's all buried in a big mass of, of text and files. And I did an interview back in 2004 and I was on, I did a TED talk in 2006. When you actually carve up the text and you say, yeah. okay, everything to do with waking up early here, you'll realize that you've basically given the same advice about waking up early in many different contexts, using many different ways of saying it over and over and over again. Right. And as a bucket, it's really just wake up early, set an alarm. But, you know, you've been set, you know, and I, that's just that's obviously not a real example. But if you see what I mean, like the buckets allow you to realize the repetition because it puts together all the pieces that are around one subtopic, and then you quickly see the repetition. David, I feel like we could have five more conversations and they would just get longer and more interesting. Um, but, uh, but I want to know, um, how can people work with you if they want to hire you? What can they hire you for? How, how much do you cost? You know, tell us, tell us stuff about working with you. Sure. So I, my main thing is, is book proposals and books for traditional publishers usually, um, because the expertise that I bring to the table is my time in, in large part spent as an acquiring editor. So you and, say pre you know, preparing the book proposal, working with the author on it. And when you say books, you mean writing them, ghostwriting? I them. mean, writing everything. I oh, write everything. Okay. Oh, okay. You write the book proposal so, too. Mm -hmm. I do. I do. Mm -hmm. I write everything. And um, for, for that job, the proposal is a sales document. It is not a book plan first and foremost. It's a sales document first and mm -hmm. foremost. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really understand just as a book is, has to be designed around the reader, the book proposal has to be designed around the editor and the publisher and, and the agent if you don't have one. And so mm -hmm. that's how I build it in the same way that I built the book from the reader first. And so that process, it's a very specific thing. It's not necessarily helpful the way I do it. In other words, you can do a book plan without me for a book proposal. I bring something extra to it. And that's the project that I find most rewarding because I really like exciting the publisher's attention. And for that, people can work with me. But it's probably, you know, it's if you don't have a platform, if you don't have substantial resources and success, it's pro I'm probably not a great fit. And then I also write the books. And again, that's even tighter because I can only do one book at a time, even with all my productivity tips. <laughs> and it's often... <laughs> even with the getting up a, early. Even with the... even getting up early. I get it at five. <laughs> Still not enough. Um, and it's generally someone I've done the proposal for as well, although not always. Uh -huh. And and again, it's generally a pretty major project. And you're hired by the publisher, so you, you said. So it's it's not like, you know... It, no, no, so no. It's I'm, hired, I'm often hired by the author, but the agent... Arranged by the... Yeah. Uh, it's the agents often who will come to me because what will happen is the agent will need so-and-so. Oh, you did X. You're such a big mm. deal. Write a book. I don't know how to write a book. Talk to Dave. And right. that's, that's how my, my work goes. Got it. Got it. So a self-publishing author is not is not going to... Um, is not the, the, the right kind of client for you. That's right. Okay, great. Well, um, and where can we find you on the internet, Dave, if we want to? Well, I write a newsletter um, with this kind of thing, if people find it useful, called The Maven Game, and it's at mavengame.com. Great. And your company is Bookitect? That's right. Bookitect, like architect, but for books. That took me 30 seconds when I decided to become a freelancer, but <laughs> I thought it was clever. Um, and it's bookitect.com, yeah. Great. Thank you so much for all your generous and um, helpful advice. It was really super fascinating conversation. My pleasure, Maggie. I really hope this conversation has inspired you to give so much of your gift to the world that it expands you into your greatest possible version of yourself. Remember, it's not selfish just because we also benefit from it. And here's where I get to make a selfish request. New podcasts need all the help they can get. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and subscribe to us on your favorite platform. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Selfish Gift Podcast. And send me a DM. I'd love to hear how you're sharing your gift with the world.